Financial planners tell us that in the next decade or so, there will be approximately $13 trillion inherited by the baby boomers and the baby busters. $13 trillion. That's 13 with 12 zeros after it. That's a whole lot of money. Now, unfortunately, when my father passed away, his will simply said, I, being of sound mind, spent it all. <laughs> and so uh, I don't have a whole lot to look forward to. But uh, financial planners tell us that we ought to get our financial house in order because if we don't, uh, the government, the United States government, is just sitting around waiting to uh, collect it from us in the form of uh, taxation. When Elvis Presley died very suddenly, uh, more than 60% of his estate was uh, scooped up by government taxes. Millions and millions of dollars, of course. He didn't need it at that point, and uh, Priscilla's done all right since then with uh, the development of his name. He's worth more in his death than he was in his life. But uh, there's an enormous amount that is to be lost if we are not planning. But far more important than that is the planning of our eternal inheritance. And that is the inheritance that Paul talks about, the greatest inheritance of all. And that's the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, we've been going through the book of uh, Galatians, and I just want to kind of bring us up to date here so that we can catch back up as to where we are in the book. You remember, the book is divided into six chapters. The first two chapters are biographical, the next two chapters are theological, and the last two chapters are applicational. And so we're in the middle of Galatians, Galatians 3 and 4, where Paul argues that salvation and sanctification are by faith and not by the works of the law. And he has given us a number of arguments that we have looked at. The first argument was an experiential argument. You remember? In Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul says, let's talk about your experience. How did you receive the Spirit of God? Did you receive it by the works of the law, or by did, you, did you receive it by the hearing of faith? Experience tells you that it is a life of faith. Then he looked at a historical argument in the life of Abraham. He said, let's look at Abraham, your forefather. Abraham was declared righteous before the law was ever in existence. And so the Christian life, the spiritual life, can't be by the law. It must be by faith because Abraham was justified by faith. And then two weeks ago, we looked at, or a couple weeks ago, we looked at the legal precedent as the Apostle Paul looked at six passages from the Old Testament from the Old Testament law that all affirmed that the law only brings a curse, but faith brings a blessing, that the law brings judgment, but that faith brings freedom and deliverance. And then today we're going to look at a legal analogy that the Apostle Paul will use. So open up your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. And let's look at the legal analogy that the Apostle Paul brings to bear on his main argument that salvation and sanctification are by faith apart from the law. The great inheritance does not come through legal means, but it comes through a promise. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says, Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. He's going to have an illustration here. He says, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant or a human will or testament that has been duly established, so it is in this case. He's appealing to them by way of analogy. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, a person would establish their will. They would put down who they wanted their estate to go to. 
and they could decide, just like today, anybody that they wanted to. If they, being of sound mind, could go to the court register and register the will, then that will was permanent. It couldn't be changed. The, in fact, if they wanted to allow for future children or for any changes, the person who was creating the will would have to put that stipulation in the will. If they didn't put a statement in there saying, I reserve the right to change this in the future, and it was registered, it could never be changed. In fact, in ancient Near Eastern history, an adopted son had stronger rights than a birth son. Because when an adopted son was brought into the family, it was through a written document that was registered and declared. And so he had something on paper where a birth son, well, it was the word of the father, not the written document of the father that might determine future inheritance. And so what Paul is trying to say is, let's just look at a common analogy, an illustration from life. You know that when a human being sets down and makes a will, and it is established and it is registered, that it cannot be changed. You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. Now, if a human will is irreconcilable or it can't be changed, irrevocable, how much more if God determines to will something or God determines an inheritance? Look at verse 16. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Both the Hebrew and the Greek terms for seed can be taken in a collective sense or in a singular sense. And Paul, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understands that when God said to Abraham, it is in your seed that all the nations of the earth will be blessed, that God was ultimately focusing in upon one seed. You remember this overhead from previous uh, study of Galatian, Galatians, the various seeds of Abraham. There was the natural seed, which was the physical birth. Then there was the spiritual seed, which was the old covenant believers of Israel. Then there is the spiritual seed, which is the new covenant believers of the church age today. But the ultimate fulfillment as Paul says theologically in the Abrahamic covenant, is the seed, the fulfillment of the Lord Jesus Christ as the seed, the seed in which all nations, all families of the earth would be blessed. And so Paul identifies that here in verse 16. He says the promises, not the, in, not the will, not the testament, not the covenant, but the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. All the promises of God center upon the person of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who brings the fulfillment of the inheritance to all people. Now look at verse 17 of Galatians. He says, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Abraham was born in about 2165 BC. He entered into the promised land about 2090 BC at the age of 70 to 75 years old. That was the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your descendants great. You're going to have a great name, and you're going to be a blessing to all of the world. Well, in 
2079, Ishmael was born. Or, yes, Ishmael was born. 2065, Isaac was born. Then we have Jacob. And it is to Jacob, as Jacob enters into the promised land, that the covenant to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then to the 12 sons is affirmed. But for 400, 500, 600 years, the promises are in existence. And then comes the law. And so what Paul is saying is, you Jewish people who are trusting in the law for your salvation, you are all wrong because the inheritance and the salvation is in the promises that came 430 years before, the time from the Exodus to the final confirmation to Jacob as he entered into the promised land. Verse 18, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it can no longer depend on a promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Our great eternal inheritance does not come through the law of works, but it comes through the promise of faith. Now, in order to really appreciate this or understand it, there is something that we need to understand about ancient Near Eastern history. There were two kinds of covenants. One was called a suzerainty treaty. The second one was called a royal grant. And if we understand the difference between these two, then this passage in Galatians is going to make wonderful sense to us. First of all, the suzerainty treaty. The suzerainty treaty was like a handshake, all right, between two peoples, a superior and an inferior, a lord and the subjects. And in the suzerainty treaty, which is represented like by the book of Deuteronomy, the superior would say to the inferior, I will have a relationship with you, but here are all the laws that will govern our relationship. And if you obey those laws, then things will go well for you. But if you disobey those laws, I will judge you. They are called the blessings and the cursings that we see in the book of Deuteronomy. And the Mosaic Covenant, or the Mosaic Code, is representative of a suzerainty treaty. It was for the nation of Israel. It was God entering into a relationship with them as a nation, saying to them, if you do this, I will do this. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. And that was one form of covenant that was very common in ancient Near Eastern history. There was a second style of covenant, which was called the royal grant. And this was an open-armed covenant promise. This was where the king would say to the people or say to the particular subject, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you prosperity. I'm going to give you blessings. And I guarantee that it is going to happen. It is my gift or grant to you. In an analogy today, I would say, like for a student going to a university, it's the difference between a grant and a loan. <laughs> a grant is something you get, free money. A loan is something that you're going to pay back someday. Let me expand this just a little bit more so that we can appreciate the great differences between the two, because this is important both in understanding the Old Testament and understanding Paul's argument this morning. A treaty was based upon two parties. It was a handshake between two parties, a superior and an inferior. A royal grant was the king saying to the people, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to take care of you. One was bilateral, that is a joint agreement. One was unilateral, guaranteed. The treaty was conditional. It could be canceled. It could be set aside like the Old Testament law was. The royal grant was unconditional. It was guaranteed 
by the king that he was going to fulfill it and it could not be taken back. The treaty was based upon laws. The royal grant was based upon promises. The treaty was very uncertain. The promises of the royal grant were guaranteed. The treaty was simply temporary, but the royal grant was an irrevocable, eternal gift to the people. Now, when the Apostle Paul is talking here in this particular passage, he is actually contrasting a treaty to a royal grant. Let's go back to verse uh, 18 and pick it up again. Verse 18, he says, For if the inheritance, that is the inheritance of the royal grant, of the promises to Abraham that we've been looking at, depends upon the law, then it can no longer depend on a promise. It's either a royal grant or it's a treaty. And if it's a treaty, then it can be taken away. It can be canceled. It can be changed. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. The promises to Abraham are a royal grant. They are irrevocable. God is going to fulfill his word. Verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Was the purpose of the law to save us? No. The purpose of the law was to convict us, to show us our sinfulness so that we would depend upon the Lord. Let me give you an example. Back during the days when I was in the plumbing trades, I had a Jewish plumber that lived near me, and we were working way out in, it wasn't so, it's not way out today, but we were working way out in the Troy Commerce area. And so we would uh, drive together. And I had a burden for this man, and so I would talk to him about his Jewish background and his Jewish faith, and Hiram and I would have very interesting discussions. But one of the things that Hiram did not believe was that he was a sinner. He did not believe that he had really done anything wrong to violate God's word, that he was a good neighbor, he was a good father, he was a good plumber, and he was just a good, nice person. And overall, he was. He was a delightful man to work with. But I asked him one day, I said, Hiram, can we just take a little bit of time and go through the Ten Commandments? So I opened up my Bible, and I started with the first commandment, and I talked with him about it. Have you ever violated that? Well, yeah. Went through the second one? Yeah. Went through the third one? We, we didn't get to seven and eight before Hiram was very convicted and understood that he was a sinner, that he had transgressed God's law. And so then I took just a simple illustration. I said, Hiram... Not being nosy, but let's say you were to violate one of these commandments every day by action and one of them by thought. And let's say you violated them by not doing something good that you should do. Just three a day. Well, that's a thousand a year. How old are you, Hiram? Well, I'm 57. That's 57,000 sins, Hiram. I said, do you think that a police officer would overlook 50, 57,000 tickets? Do you think uh, a government official would look, overlook 57,000 violations? Why do you think that God should overlook 57,000 sins? And I said, quite honestly, Hiram, if you only sin three times a day, you're doing far, far better than I am. Far better. And that use of the law brought to his mind and his consciousness the understanding of sin. That is what Paul is saying is the purpose of the law. The Jewish people thought it was to save them. Paul says, no, it's to convict you. It's to get you to recognize your sin. Notice again what it says, for instance, in Romans 5.20. It says, the law was added so that the transgressions might increase. But where sin has increased, grace has increased 
all the more. In Romans 4.15, Paul says, where there is no law, there is no sin. Now, that doesn't mean there's no unrighteousness, but the law establishes the violation. Open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 7. I think uh, another important testimonial statement by the Apostle Paul about the law. Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 7. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting, coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Verse 8, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life or preserve life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? But by no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. Paul says, what is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to expose sin, to increase sin, to help us understand our sinfulness so that we will then depend upon the Savior or upon the promise. The Jewish people had fallen into a works method of salvation, which was never intended by God and which was impossible. The law was mediated by angels and by Moses as arbitrators applied the principles to life. But the promises came to Abraham directly from God as a royal grant guaranteeing the future inheritance. Notice, for instance, don't look at this, but in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 27, the people say to Moses, you go near and you listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then you come and tell us whatever the Lord our God wants us to do. We will listen to you and we will obey. You see, that, that is a covenant, a treaty, one in which the people have to fear because the covenant can end. There is judgment involved. But in the promise of the seed of Jesus Christ, there is a royal grant that guarantees us security, guarantees us eternal life, guarantees us open arms. For in the royal grant, there cannot be rejection because it is the responsibility of the king to make it work and to make it happen. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul goes on, he says, A mediator, however, does not just represent one party. A mediator, like in the Mosaic Covenant, is a, an agreement between two parties. And the mediator represents both parties. As we recently saw, how the federal judge, I believe it was, was able to help the GM strike move along. He was going to function as a judicial legal mediator, looking at both sides, looking at the legal issues. He was able to, in a sense, maybe help move that along. But in this verse it says, but God is one. God is standing alone, not as a mediator of a Mosaic law covenant, but as the royal grant giver, the one who promises to fulfill his word. The mediator of the Old Covenant was Moses, and it was an agreement between two parties. The mediator of the New Covenant is Jesus Christ, and it also is an agreement between two parties. But the covenant promises to Abraham were sovereignly and unilaterally guaranteed by God through Jesus Christ. 
And that should provide us a sense of security. We don't have to worry about God changing the promise. It's a grant. It's a gift. It's guaranteed. We don't have to worry about things ending, being temporal. They are eternal. God will fulfill his word. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. The law doesn't bring us life. It brings us condemnation. And if the law could bring life, then there would have been no need for Jesus Christ to die. For Jesus Christ, the seed, provides the final gift for the fulfillment of the royal grant through Abraham. Galatians 3.22, But the scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. God had had established that he would use the law, in a sense, to put everybody in spiritual jail. The particular word here that is used for the uh, whole world as a prisoner of sin was used of a military unit that would try to outflank the enemy and force them into a position where they were totally trapped, where they would have to surrender, where they would realize their inability to fight any longer, their inability to win their way, and they would simply surrender to the king that was wanting to claim them. And that is what the purpose of the law is. The purpose of the law is for us to realize that there is no way that we can save ourselves, that there is no way that we can measure up to the holy standard of God, and that once we understand that we are shut up by sin and enclosed by our helplessness, that we then look to the Lord as our king, and by faith we embrace Jesus Christ to receive the promised inheritance. That is the purpose of the law. It is to close us up that we might open up to God. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. The Apostle Paul, speaking of the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Verse 27, And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the, what? Patriarchs. The patriarchs. For God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable. You see, God made a promise to Abraham that he would bless his descendants, that he would multiply them, that he would bless all nations of the earth because of Abraham. And so we see that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable upon those that he is going to save. And so God will save them and bring them. Verse 30, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. That's the purpose of the law, to 
get us to see our sinfulness, to so envelop us with helplessness that we will trust upon the Lord and believe in him. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. He is the one who has fulfilled the promise of God. And he is the one who offers to us today salvation and sanctification by faith and not by the works of the law. God has given to us a royal grant, irrevocable, eternal, guaranteed. It is the great inheritance that we will all receive. You know, I, like uh, my brother Bruce, who honestly shared today about how he would like to have a little more of this or a little more of that, you know, I'm that way also. I'd like to have a little more of this. I'd like to have a little more of that. But you know what? That's just part of who we are as human beings. But you know, when we meet the Lord, someday as we sung this morning, we're going to have it all, and it will all be good for us. Because God has promised the great inheritance, not through a treaty of law, but through a promised royal grant of covenant blessings. Now, maybe there's someone here today who has never personally trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe you think that you've got to be good enough for God. <laughs> well, understand what the law says. Understand what the scripture says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The purpose of the law is to shut us up in sin that we might turn and look to the Savior. And I would encourage you today to stop trying and start trusting. Simply believe in the royal grant, the promise of God's inheritance, that if we will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Now, I'm sure that there's others of us who are here today who are believers in Jesus Christ, and we're just struggling with the whole pilgrimage of faith, just walking by faith, wondering at times, you know, God, where are you in the crises of life when I have physical problems, when I have financial problems, when I have family problems, when I have difficult decisions to make? Lord, where are you in my life? And what is your will for me? Well, I would encourage you to, first of all, maybe open up to something like Hebrews chapter 11 and look at heaven's hall of fame there, the hall of fame of faith, and just take some time this week and meditate on Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, people trusted God, and God honored his promises and he brought the answers to their prayer. Salvation and sanctification are by faith. And you know, we need to simply pray. We need to believe. And then we need to wait upon the Lord. That's the hard part, isn't it? The waiting part. Waiting for the Lord to answer a prayer and to provide for us. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, says to them, the law is not the way of life. It is a life of faith. And in the trials and the tribulations and the decisions of life, we need to keep trusting God. And you can trust him because he doesn't have a treaty with you, but he has a royal grant. And that royal grant guarantees that God will fulfill his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of our mediator, your mediator, 
the God-man, Jesus Christ. And Father, we come to you today and pray that you might affirm in our hearts the life of faith, that our salvation does not come through doing, but through believing, through trusting, and that our sanctification also is a life of faith as we seek each and every day to follow you. As Paul said in concluding chapter 2 and opening up chapter 3, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, help me.